if we go back, Yellow made a lot of expensive acquisitions in the early 2000s. And then in the 2008 financial crisis, all of its customers ran away because, of course, spending dropped significantly. And uh, they took a billion dollar loss that year. And then they tried to file for bankruptcy in 2009, but it was avoided because the Teamsters came in and negotiated and agreed to take a pay cut in order to keep its staff employed. So the Teamsters actually saved Yellow back in 2009, and then it considered bankruptcy again in 2014 and in 2020. So the difference between the earnings yield of the S&P 500 and the returns from the 10-year government bond was roughly just 1.1 percentage points last week, which is the smallest gap since 2002. Well, actually, the, the spread of the 10-year treasury, treasury inflation protected security is often considered to be a more accurate measure due to its adjustment with inflation. Emmet, Amory, welcome to another episode of Stock Club. Good to have you both on. Um, we have a busy show today, so we're just going to get straight into it. I'm afraid we don't have time to talk about humans dressed as bears. Um, <laughs> But uh, for this week, we're kicking off. We're back to some industrial action. So I feel like we've been talking about this Hollywood strike for about a month, mm. but it is really taking over basically the entire entertainment industry. Uh, yeah. So since we last chatted, visual effects workers are now threatened to unionize and join the strike. I think mm -hmm. they were just sitting around on their hands anyways. I don't know if there was much work going around. Uh, and as well as that, in South Korea, the actors union is threatening to strike too. So we are touched on Netflix a while back and their kind of international production. So that could be a big factor there as well. Apart from that, apart from Hollywood, we'll say the trucking company Yellow, whose workers are represented by the Teamsters Union, uh, has just filed for bankruptcy as well. So there's an awful lot going on when it comes to unionization, industrial action and how it affects public companies. So let's take a step back and just start with unions. So why are they so important? And especially in relation to public companies, why should investors be aware of unionization and the risks it might carry? Yeah, it's it's um, a good question. I read a lot of studies this week to try and figure out the answer to that. It it seems like many economic issues, you're like, oh, it'll knock on and create some good things and some bad things. But um, just some of the numbers kind of around what unions can do for workers. Studies show that union workers receive roughly 20 to 30% higher wages and benefits than non-union workers. So the question really becomes, does this mean that less profit falls to shareholders? Does this mean there are fewer stock buybacks and less money going into dividends and that type of thing? And um, while paying workers more does mean that there are fewer resources available to hire new workers, um, studies have shown that productivity is either improved um, or unaffected by union efforts. And most studies show that collective bargains as I mentioned, um, end up lo lowering the amount of money that falls to the bottom line is you have to fork over more money for wages and benefits. Um, but I suppose if you have a unionized staff and you work well with them, you at least get to divert the the the, you, the opportunity of a strike because as we know, strikes can be very, very expensive as we've seen from Hollywood these days. Uh, I saw the CEO of uh, Discovery coming out and saying, oh, um, we saved $100 million this quarter because we didn't have to pay anyone. Um, but it's estimated that so far the strike has cost the entertainment industry, each studio, something like $250 million. So it's not really a savings. Um, but a, a, a consideration for... Um, how bad strikes are going to be and, and a unionized effort is going to be for new industries because as, as you were kind of talking about at the top it's seeming more and more that industrial action is appealing to people that we haven't considered and we talked about this a bit last year in terms of starbucks so what would happen if if the entirety of starbucks is staffed to unionize um and i actually think that the the more important question is to frame those within the industries in which they're happening or the sectors in which they are happening. I don't think there's like a blanket answer um, across the board. And that is because as companies have unionized workers, it often means that they have to redeploy capital towards labor instead of business investments, R&D and other assets like plant property and equipment, um, which does make a lot of economists argue that, hey, like that slows down growth. If you think about huge tech companies, software companies, they need a tremendous amount of cash in order to promote growth because they're constantly innovating. Um, but I was kind of thinking, you know, if you're in a traditional brick and mortar retailer, if you're in something that's really consumer facing and pulley heavy, that's probably not as big of a concern. And actually, interestingly, there have been studies that have found that unionized businesses limit risk taking, but that constrains overinvestment and actually improves information flow within a business. 
which reduces the likelihood of any kind of stock crash. So it's that idea of it forces management to consider their workers more and it just makes them ponder decisions a little bit. They have less money just flowing around waiting for them to make some kind of bad decision. Um, And I like that idea that, you know, management is forced to just be a little bit more considerate. And that actually means that at the end of the day, their business is able to survive through good and bad. Um, Additionally, it's worth mentioning that unionized businesses tend to attract talent and have reduced turnover. Um, This tends to uh, increase employee commitment because they feel like they're being taken care of. Um, That actually makes me think of Costco, which is a stock that I haven't spoken about in several episodes, which means it's due. Um, But they're an industry leader in pay and benefits in the traditional brick and mortar retail grocery space. Um, And their staff are interestingly not unionized. That's just something that Costco's management opted to do in the early 1990s. And that means that they do have industry leading retention. And when that effort was announced, I think in 1991 or 1992, uh, it royally punished Costco stock, the street and investors were just not interested in this, this type of thing. You know, if I I mean, it is pretty shocking if you were to all of a sudden come out and say, hey, all of our staff are going to be paid $18 an hour, we're going to pay for comprehensive medical insurance. And if they want to go to college, we'll, you know, give them a few thousand dollars along the way. Um, But as time kind of war on, we did start to realize, hey, like in the long term, this is actually going to save a bunch of money. Um, And that is why, you know, we saw Costco stock be incredibly suppressed all through the 1990s and the early 2000s. Of course, there were other uh, exterior market conditions going on there. Um, But now, God, like Costco is one of like the best performing stocks that we have looked at. um, And it is somewhat of a street favor. People are willing to pay a, a premium valuation on that stock. That's also a point that's maybe worth mentioning is um, I think Costco trades at like an industry all time valuation. So it is the thing of, oh, yeah, you get to feel good about the workers are being paid well. So then probably investors are willing to shell out a little bit more because it's maybe an ESG play. Um, but this idea of of unionization will inevitably hurt a shareholder seems to be true in the short term, but not necessarily in the long term. Um, Findings suggest that the average effects of a union win at a workplace will decrease the market value of an affected business by 10 to 14%. um, But that tends to kick in within the first 18 months of the announcement being made and a vote going through. And then a stock will eventually over time recover. Um, It is though... Then again, the argument of if you have a business that its growth is highly dependent upon stock buybacks and dividends, then yes, like maybe the performance of the stock over time will slow down because they just don't have as much capital to play with. But then again, you're going to have an economist come in and make the argument like, hey, uh, causing more businesses to unionize ensures that more money goes back into the hands of employees, um, which means that consumers have more cash to play with, which means that they spend more and that decreases wealth inequality, which is good for the overall economy. So, you know, maybe if you're thinking in the long term, you can comfortably say, hey, I am fine with, you know, more and more industries moving back towards unionization. That being said, after, you know, going through all these studies and talking about all these statistics, it is also worth mentioning that unionization in the United States is a minority. In 1983, about 20% of employees belong to a union. And as of 2021, that number had dropped to just over 10%. This is not a mass labor movement unless more and more people start to vote to join unions, which, you know, as you mentioned at the top, there are a few trickles of labor movements moving in, but I we have yet to see like a really significant player say, hey, our staff has voted to unionize. So that would be something um, to keep an eye on. And also a little bit of reassurance that I felt um, researching this topic was that the annual in his annual letter to investors, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink wrote that workers demanding more from their employers is an essential feature of effective capitalism. It drives prosperity and creates a more competitive landscape for talent, pushing companies to create better, more innovative environments for their employees, actions that will help them achieve greater profits for their shareholders. So it seems like he's thinking again, in the more long term view of, hey, this just is going to push more and more cash into the economy, which is good for businesses over the long term. Yeah, it's interesting how you talk about short term versus long term there. And probably the problem with modern leadership and stuff is that they're very much rewarded for short term results. And you see this yeah. with Starbucks's big pushback against unionization, what's happening with Amazon as well. So it is a pity to to see that maybe if those were founding CEOs fighting that fight uh, yeah. or, you know, say, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg with his incredible lead vast ownership structure, it might be a different story. Whereas if they're kind of more short term, especially Andy Jassy and Amazon, where Mm -hmm. he's replacing Bezos and that like huge figure and those huge, huge shoots to fill, it's a different situation, but yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it's, it's also worth mentioning just that the majority of this strike action and unionization action is in labor intensive fields at the minute. You know, it's it's in things where people are working exceptionally hard. Um, and you, if you can, like you'd say, oh, like tech workers, you know, software engineers, they're not pushing to unionize. And it's like, well, they get compensated with huge stock based compensation packages typically when they go into any major tech company. So they are effectively already making a tremendous amount of money. So I'd see this as just really a rebalancing of of how we perceive and value labor. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, let's go around the house then to kind of the three major topics I mentioned. So we're starting off with the visual effects artists. Mm -hmm. So they're essentially just uh, joining the Hollywood strike, I imagine. Is that is that pretty much it? Yeah, they're voting to join a union. And I'm actually quite happy for the VFX artists because I remember several years ago watching a Last Week Tonight episode in which it revealed that VFX artists and video game designers are some of the only non-unionized groups within entertainment. And that really means that they bear the brunt of labor um, within that market. And they get really taken advantage of. They have famously terrible working hours, you know, sleeping in the office, that type of stuff. Low pay. They are always on temporary contracts, which means they get hired in for a certain job. And as soon as the job is done, they get laid off. Um, because they're on temporary contracts, it means that it's almost impossible for them to negotiate any kind of benefits or pay increases, and they often do not have health insurance. So it's really like the worst of the worst. Um, and that group that, that you mentioned at the top that is beginning the process of unionization is the onset FX artists within Marvel Studios so that is then within Disney. Uh, and there's only about 50 of them, so very small. Um, but they did when they voted on this uh, idea, it had a super majority. So that's good to see. Um, on set VFX artists are people like data wranglers, production managers, witness camera operators, and assistants on both film and TV productions. Um, and they are attempting to join the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, which represents 168,000 technicians and craft people across live theater, film, and television. So they're very well suited to kind of joining this union. Um, in a statement, the IATSE's uh, VFX organizer, Mark Pat, said, for almost half a century, workers in the visual effects industry have been denied the same protections and benefits their coworkers and crewmates have relied upon since the beginning of the Hollywood film industry. This is a historic first step for VFX workers coming together with a collective voice demanding respect for the work that they do. So this is nice um, and insignificant, but it is incredibly small. You know, it's only 50 people, um, but it is something to, to keep an eye on uh, if it continues to be a movement. I know um, myself and Mike spoke yesterday about the actors and um, the writers going on strike seems to be indicating to the broader industry that there is weakness here, that this, that, you know, it's, it seems like all these individual groups are waking up and going, yeah, we're all being compressed. We're all down here at the bottom and the studios are making all this money and we're not. Um, and so I think it could spark something where we could see directors and producers, um, independent producers joining in this fight and going on strike. And that would be incredibly detrimental um, to Hollywood. So again, this is a story that investors should be keeping an eye on, particularly if they own Disney or Warner Brothers or Paramount since they are big studios that tend to have big VFX budgets. Um, but it's also going to hurt streamers because even though Netflix maybe isn't putting out an Avengers film, you know, they are putting out The Irishman and all those dudes had to be de-aged and that's the VFX. So um, yeah, definitely something to watch. Mm, could be that first domino to fall. On Netflix, we talked uh, a few weeks back when we were first talked about the strike about how Netflix's international production capabilities could protect it slightly because this is very much a US strike. But... That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So the South Africa, mm -hmm. South Koreans Actors Union is looking at uh, striking itself. So what's happening there? Yeah, it's a very similar situation of like they seem to be bearing the brunt of streamers coming in, disrupting this industry, and then just not really treating people very well. Um, apparently, the Korean Broadcasting Actors Union has been attempting to get in contact with Netflix, and they're just refusing to come to the table or speak to them or acknowledge them um, in any way, which is very interesting because local broadcasters within Korea have already begun negotiating uh, with performers there. Um, according to Union President Song Chang-gon, he states that supporting actors earn less working for Netflix series than local Korean network shows because they are paid per episode for fewer episodes, despite them being far more labor intensive and taking longer to shoot. So they're per episode rate for a supporting actor is $300 per episode. But those episodes are often taking several days to a week to shoot. You know, if you think about the complexity and the coverage needed for something like Squid Game, it makes sense. But imagine making only $300 to go into like a week and a half 
worth of work. And then on top of that, similar to every single actor currently on strike in the United States, South Korean actors are not receiving residuals. So they're not getting anything off the back end, which you would normally get um, off of a traditional network television show. So they are, again, making more on the back end working in a local TV station than they would coming in and being in like a huge international Netflix drama that brings in all of this money and is credited with kind of sparking the second wave of people signing up for Netflix. Um, and so this is really, yeah, throwing a spanner in the works in terms of the argument that we saw all across Wall Street in that, oh, Netflix will be protected from the strike because they source so much content from outside the United States. Um, if we were to see the South Korean actors go on strike, I would say that that market is, as of right now, where there seems to be a big cultural push towards you know people being accepting and interested in South Korean culture and art, um, I would say that would be probably a, a big... Uh, annoyance and impact for Netflix in terms of its ability to bring out new content in the next probably 12 to 18 months. Um, so if they effectively go on strike, it would be very, very interesting. Um, as of right now, it seems the Korea Broadcasting Performers Rights Association would like their contracts to not necessarily resemble SAG contracts in terms of compensation, but in terms of rights. So they are asking that whatever the SAG policy ends up being for streaming residuals, they would like that matched in the South Korean market, um, which, you know, that's, again, takes a, could take a huge chunk out of Netflix's profit margin. So, mm. yeah, another one to watch. Okay, lastly, then we have Yellow, which is one of America's oldest trucking companies. So it just filed for bankruptcy and actually blamed extended contract negotiations with the Teamsters Union, which is essentially mm -hmm. the Truck Drivers Union, um, as the cause for its failure. Now, I think this is blaming the wall you crashed into for the car crash, but <laughs> um, how did this one play out? Because we know the Teamsters Union are famous or maybe infamous for the power yeah. they've held in America for 60, 70 years, ever since the yeah. days of Jimmy Hoffa and the the connections he had, we'll, we'll put it that way. Uh, yeah. So what happened with Yellow? Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, uh, Yellow CEO, he really, he came out swinging at the bankruptcy announcement. He tried to play, bl place the entirety of blame upon the Teamsters, which is never a good idea. It's kind of like a famous... I don't know, saying in America where everyone is always like, you do not mess with the Teamsters. They are incredibly no. powerful. They're very well connected. You just, you, you don't want to do it. Like if the Teamsters go on strike, nothing moves. So like nothing yeah. can happen. So many industries are affected. Um, but Yellow CEOs, his name is Darren Hawkins, who unrelated, he made $1.27 million last year. Just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, also and he, very brave man. Like if this is in the yeah. 60s, I don't think Darren Hawkins would be. <laughs> no, you'd be in the river. be talking like, like this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Be in the river. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is his, his quote. All workers boots. and employers should take note of our experience and worry. A company has the right to manage its own operations. But as we have experienced, union leadership was able to halt our business, literally driving our company out of business despite every effort to work with them. And so now we will go over what Yellow has done over the past eight years to put itself out of business. Um so in recent months, the company began bargaining for its next union contract. It needed to sign one before March of 2024, um, but they stood pretty far apart on issues. As we know, the Teamsters in the last year to two have been really pushing for an increase in pay. They wanted an $11 per hour increase over the next five years. They wanted pension fund payments, and they wanted a couple of operational changes. Um, all of these conditions, interestingly, were just met by UPS. So obviously, it is possible to be in the shipping industry and meet this. Um, the Teamsters were already pretty suspicious of Yellow coming into this negotiation because it had failed to make payments to the employee pension fund, and they owned they owed their employees fifty million dollars in pension contributions, which is uh, pretty significant. And the Teamsters had threatened to go on strike, and then Yellow came to the negotiating negotiating table and begged for more time, and the Teamsters granted that, um, which is unusual from for them. Like that is very much a an unusual thing to see, um, but. If we go back, Yellow made a lot of expensive acquisitions in the early 2000s. And then in the 2008 financial crisis, all of its customers ran away because, of course, spending dropped significantly. And uh, they took a billion dollar loss that year. And then they tried to file for bankruptcy in 2009, but it was avoided because the Teamsters came in and negotiated and agreed to take a pay cut in order to keep its staff employed. So the Teamsters actually saved Yellow back in 2009, and then it considered bankruptcy again in 2014 and in 2020. Um, and before it declared on Tuesday that it was going bankrupt, it has over 100,000 creditors, including Amazon. So lots yeah. of people are and, coming to get their money. And the U.S. government, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It got something like $700 million in uh, 
in yep. the COVID loans, the whatever small business loans. Yep, it received seven hundred million dollars under uh, the CARES Act. Uh, interestingly, though, they are currently at the center of an investigation by the Congressional Oversight Committee because they received that money fraudulently. So in its documentation, Yellow claimed that it qualified for a care loan as a company vital to U.S. national security interests because it argued that it sometimes delivers to military bases around the country. But the Congressional Committee's final report determines that any other freight company could have provided this delivery service and Yellow was not essential. And interestingly, under the CARES Act for national security businesses, Yellow received the entirety of the budget for that sector. $700 million was allocated for all national security companies in the United States. So it took everything. Um, and while management came out when they announced bankruptcy, the second statement that they made was that they do intend to, do, to fully pay back the federal government for this loan. Um, We'll see if that happens. Seven hundred million dollars is pretty significant. Um, and then, very briefly, kind of what this means for the industry. Yellow is a less than load transport company, meaning it delivers smaller quantities of freight, somewhere between like a full trailer truckload to like an individual parcel. So, like an Amazon delivery person. Um, they made up about nine percent of the LTL market in the United States. So, this is a, a, a big thing to happen. But there are lots of other players in this industry. The most famous is FedEx. So, I would say the other players are just going to eat up this market share. Um, and then, if you're worried about any kind of business that's reliant upon freight or shipping, no fear. Um, because when Yellow failed to make those pension payments of $50 million a couple months ago, the Teamsters already signaled that something was wrong. And so the vast majority of Yellow's clients have already left over the last couple months. They have seen their shipping volume drop by 80%. So it seems like everybody already knew that this was going to happen. Um, so I wouldn't expect it to have a huge ripple effect on the e-commerce industry. Okay. And then lastly, obviously, because this is what happens now in these markets, mm -hmm. um, the stock was shooting up the day it announced bankruptcy and a short squeeze. Yeah, a little bit of a short squeeze. Jumped 24% uh, on Tuesday. Not great. Um, there have been a couple of short squeezes the last couple of weeks. Tupperware just went. Nikola went. Um, together, these stocks have resulted in $435 million in losses for short sellers this month. That's pretty significant. Um, but my favorite little nugget that's emerged from this trend is Dan Loeb, who's the CEO of Third Point Hedge Fund, in his recent letter to investors said, fundamental analysis is increasingly taking a backseat to monitoring daily option expiries and Reddit message boards. As evidenced by the numerous short squeezes and manipulations of heavily shorted stocks such as AMC and GameStop in 2021 and others this, this year. While we have not yet abandoned short selling, we continue to reduce our single name short exposure in favor of market hedges and short baskets. Um, and this was kind of an interesting thing to hear from Loeb. And it's kind of something that we have been talking about over the last couple of weeks, even just internally, this idea that there are so many independent individual investors now in the market because of the access that's been granted by things like Robinhood. And it does seem to be having a real and almost permanent impact on the market. It's making things far more vol volatile and unpredictable. Um, and I'm very interested to see what this kind of does to the the, the long term um, impact on the market. It seems to only be affecting the short term, you know, things like short selling and options and that type of thing. But um, I wonder, yeah, what the, the decade outlook will be on this uh, investor access um, window. Yeah, Ben Carson has a really interesting kind of running theory he writes about where essentially the easier you have access to investing, the more muted the returns become, if that makes sense. Yeah. So because you can go and just invest automatically in the S&P 500 every month, it's a less, it's so much less of an effort than if you had to go and ring your broker and you weren't sure what price you were going to get and there was no index funds at the time. So obviously your returns aren't going to be as good as they were historically. Yeah. doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest, but that you can't expect whatever it was, 12% mm -hmm. per annum, like, you know, collectively. Yeah. So yeah, definitely, definitely making an impact just in terms of the access individuals have to the markets now compared to even even what, five or six years ago, even pre-Robin Hood, yeah. you know? Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, let's move on then, Emmett. I want to talk for a few moments about the equity risk premium because currently it's at a level where the incentive for investors to choose stocks over bonds has reached its lowest point in two decades. This is because the three-month treasury bills have hit a high of 5.55%. So can you start by telling us what, what the equity risk premium is? Yeah, certainly, Mike. You know, over the years, I've had the privilege to talk about some of the like sexiest stuff out there. Um, 
artificial intelligence, robotics, energy storage, DNA sequencing, gene editing, uh, aka CRISPR. We've talked about ag tech, molecular diagnosis, uh, reusable rockets, satellites, you name it. We've had a chat about it here on this podcast. And I today have been reduced to equity <coughs> risk premium, which is better known to ERP, to you and me, and maybe five of our listeners. Um, the term ERP was coined by Ranish Mehra and Edward C. Prescott in a study published in 1985 titled The Equity Premium, a Puzzle. An earlier version of the paper was published in 82 under a title, A Test of the Intertemporal Asset Pricing Model. Okay, so however, if I was asked to write a review on the back of the book that these two lads wrote, or the paper, here's how, what I would have said. Um, these guys have codified the time proven theory that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Five out of five would recommend, like and follow for more. Anyway, <laughs> the whole thing about this ERP, another way you describe ERP is a measure of why would you bother buying shares? That's what it is. It's just fancy financial person, economist person speak for, so why should I buy shares? And the way that Meher and Prescott said it, was that equity risk premium is the excess return that investing in the stock market provides over risk-free rate. So to quote them, this premium compensates investors for taking on the relatively higher risk of equity investing. And if you think about this intuitively, if stocks didn't offer a potentially higher return than risk-free investments such as government bonds. Well, why would anyone do it at all, considering that there's greater volatility and uncertainty? And there's so many ways we can answer that question. And I'll leave our listeners to hit up Google for the equation on how it's calculated. Oh, it's some laugh. It's, it's, oh, you'll really enjoy that, folks. You should really look how ERP is calculated. Believe me, you'll never look back. But it's it's this is newsworthy because, as you said, my currently the incentive for investors to choose stocks over bonds has reached its lowest point in two decades. And I know our listeners really just love when I describe the shape of a graph. It's just one of those things I do. It makes the podcast so everyone just hires the volume on their radio when they hear me describe a graph. So I'm going to do it. So basically 20 years ago, uh, the shape of the S&P 500, our benchmark index, the, the, the shape of its one year forward earnings minus the yield of 10 year treasury inflation basically gave us a little graph on, let's just call it the, um, whether the bird in the hand was better than the two in the bush. <laughs> Uh, actually won over that, invert that, sorry. So basically 20 years, wow, well, this is really fascinating, right? So about 20 years ago, the ERP was coming in at about three and a half. I'll come back to that point. And then it went up a bit uh, but to 10 years ago to a high point of about 10. And then it fell all the way back down again to where we are now, which is it's 20 year low. So basically the shape of the graph, if you like, over a 20 year period, it was an upside down V and that, uh, means the higher the point, the better stocks look, and the lower the point, the lower stocks look when compared to the alternative, which is a treasury bond. But what this means in simple plain English is that the return margin of stocks compared to treasury bonds is now notably low. Okay, so how low is that? Right, so this is so interesting. I really hope our people are still listening. I, we're going to have to jazz it up in some way at the end. So the difference between the earnings yield of the S&P 500 and the returns from the 10-year government bond was roughly just 1.1 percentage points last week, which is the smallest gap since 2002. Well, actually, the, the spread of the 10-year treasury, treasury inflation protected security, oh God, this is great stuff, is often considered to be a more accurate measure due to its adjustment with inflation. So when we bring inflation into the equation, uh, it has also de decreased the most minimal points in 2003, which is the three and a half percentage points I just mentioned in that exciting graph chat a second ago. Okay, so, <laughs> so, what, okay. What, so what does all this mean, though? So? Right. Okay. Now that's the question. So financial nerds 
uh, of which we three are complete financial nerds, is, is that the equity risk premium can't remain this low indefinitely. So that upside down V is fine, but we're not stuck now here at this point. It's going to move further down or up again. And a guy called Tim, uh, Tim Ur Urbanich told the Wall Street Journal during the week that the current stock to price to earnings ratio in a context of where interest rates just doesn't make sense. And, and again, moving it back to simple English, what most observers, market observers kind of agree on is that just because the risk premium is low, it doesn't imply that the stock market's upward trend is ending. Historically, risk premiums have been even lower, like in the late 1990s, the dot-com bubble. But over time, these premiums typically revert to the mean, usually due to reduced corporate earnings forecasts. And there's actually quite a positive outlook among investors that risk premiums is going to stabilize if bond yields decrease rather than stock values dropping. So look, with inflation potentially abating and slowing down, which is the thing that, you know, if you switch on NBC or Bloomberg television, the conversation is really, what's America going to do next with the inflation rates, um, our interest rates rather? Well, the data suggests that there's only a marginally higher likelihood of the Fed raising rates this year. And during a recent briefing, the chair of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, hinted that uh, there's a possibility of another rate hike. But he also signaled, and this is the important thing, a steady period if the economic indicators are favorable. So in summary, uh, in summary, two birds in the bush may actually be better <laughs> than one in the hand. And that economic paper, I might actually rewrite my review of it, which is like, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Unless the two in the bush are better than the one you have in your hand. So actually always I'll always prefer the two birds in a bush because we're stock investors. And all of this academic stuff is great if you're writing a white paper, if you're a lifelong student of economics and you enjoy the pursuit of the maths or the math behind that. But for us, like what bearing does what I ha what I've just said have on the potential of CRISPR therapeutics? I actually can't find, in my logic, a dotted line between a breakthrough technology that's going to change humankind and time-proven, academically approved uh, studies of the relationship between treasury bonds and the stock market. And of course, I know we can say, oh, well, I'd rather put my cash in here. It's safer and it's more assured than this other thing. But really, we invest because we have collectively agreed that a portion of one's wealth should be appropriated to things that have an outsized chance of giant returns or have a chance of outsized returns rather. And that's why we stock invest. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's definitely what we do at my wall street for individual investors. You have this opportunity to make life changing returns. And while there is that risk free rate there and it's at an all time high that make, make a difference for institutional investors and everything, but for what we're doing and for, I hope what a lot of our listeners are doing, it shouldn't be a huge factor in things. It might make some short-term fluctuations, but apart from that. Um, Amory, you were bragging to us uh, yesterday when we met before the call about how this is affecting your savings account and savings accounts in general. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's not being not being passed on in Ireland half as much as in the States, but uh, can you can you fill yeah. us in? Yeah, so increased interest rates kind of across the board and what that's done for bank profits have, have meant that you are getting some pretty great interest rates at the minute within a high yield savings account in the United States. Um, I, mine is coming in at about 4.35% APR, which is very good for a savings account. Um, I think SoFi is matching that at the minute. They might actually be a little bit ahead at 4.4, 4.5. So yeah, it is. A, if you do not have a savings account where your emergency fund is parked in something else, it is, if you're American, worthwhile looking into maybe upgrading to something with a higher interest rate. Um, that being said, the Financial Times put out a really great graph back to describing graphs, um, where they basically said the proportion of interest rates passed on to customers. So the proportion of the bank's interest rate, what if that is being passed on to customers? And up at the very top is the United Kingdom, unfortunate for us, coming in at 43. So uh, a portion of, it's like 43% of, of interest rate is being passed on to consumers in the form of interest for their own accounts. Who's down at the bottom? Ireland. Oh yeah, way down the bottom, uh. at a seven. 
Seven percent of interest yeah, rates of interest is being too, passed yeah. on to consumers, and that's actually something that two EU powers have taken a note of uh, in the last couple of days. Italy and Spain have introduced windfall taxes on banks for failing to pass on their savings to consumers. Italy is going to take forty percent of bank profits uh, this quarter in an effort to give those back uh, to citizens, which you know that's that's nice to see. So um, this is the official call out to the Central Bank of Ireland to knock on AIB's door and take the billion euros of profit that they announced for this year. It's like a little bit, 30 or 40%. And we just redistribute that amongst ourselves. Um, that'd be great. Yeah. In fairness to AIB though, they've never done anything wrong or taken any money from taxpayers before. So No, absolutely not. They have always been the noblest of businesses. Okay. Um, on that note, if you're still awake and you're still listening to us, <laughs> you might love reading from us where we don't talk about interest rates and equity risk premium for 20 minutes. We are delivering to your inbox one of the most unique products on the market and it's completely free. No one else is covering the markets we've covered with Charging and Fearless where we deliver to you a new weekly stock pitch that could be from Amsterdam, Tokyo, Paris or somewhere in between. So that is a completely free stock pitch every week. You'll have it read in 30 seconds flat and we can almost guarantee most of these companies are going to be brand new to you, which is where you get an edge. Sign up now in the show notes for this episode. Okay, uh, big deal or no big deal? Amory, I'm going to start with you and Novo Nordisk. So Nordisk, so shares of the pharma company were soaring this week as a study study showed its obesity drug Wegovy reduced the risk of heart attacks and strokes. Big deal or no big deal? Uh, yep, yeah, pretty big deal if you're going to try and uh, invest in this uh, kind of anti-obesity trend. Analysts have said that the results would essentially pressure public health systems and private health insurers into covering this new class of drug. They have been hesitant up to this point because they're very, very expensive. As we know, like all drugs that have been recently developed by a company, they tend to be prohibitively expensive, but this is essentially now like a uh, ethical issue. You know, if you're denying people who are at risk of stroke and heart attack to, to medication that could legitimately help save their life, I, I you know, I don't, I think you kind of have to do it now at this point. Um, that has meant that uh, this could create a hundred billion dollar a year obesity market uh, in the world. So um, yeah, pretty significant. If you happen to be owning any medical mutual funds that own some drug companies that have these drugs, it's probably been a, a, a great day. Novo shares surged as much as 16% upon the publication of the study. Mm. And shares in general have been soaring since the start yeah. of the year when all this Ozempic craze came out. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Emmett, we're talking about Zoom here. So it's this is a kind of sneakily strange uh, big brother type news story. Mm. So it updated its terms of service, meaning user data is now being used to train its AI and machine learning models. And you can't, basically, we can't opt out of it. So big deal or no big deal? Oh, yes, sir. Well, during the week, Zoom, as you said, updated its terms of service and um, it allows the company to use this data that we've all basically shared with it for machine learning and AI purposes without at that time providing an opt out option. So wait to hear this. The updated terms also permitted Zoom to redistribute, publish, access, use, store, transmit, review, disclose, preserve, extract, modify, reproduce, share, use, display, copy, distribute, translate, transcribe, creative derivative works and process customer content and uh, they forgot to include the kitchen sink i mean yeah, seriously. It's, say, it's a serious <laughs> collection of verbs right there you know if you went into chat gpt and said give me every variation of the word publish store and 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 kind of yeah well that's that's, write that's, me a sentence. that's a legal team that is waiting to be sued <laughs> yeah you know what i mean you they're going to use every iteration yeah, look, can you imagine the privacy advocates and legal experts when they when they saw this? They got so discombobulated. You can just imagine people's mouths fell open. <laughs> it's really unbelievable. But Zoom responded anyway because you know the world sat up, and you know the privacy and legal experts in the in the area obviously took to their keyboards or whatever and and made it clear that this was not cool. And and Zoom responded by stating that customers can decide whether to enable generative AI features and separately whether to share the customer content with Zoom for product improvement 
purposes, which is all very confusing because I think in, in the world we live in where we interact with hundreds of technical products a year, whether you're subscribing for Disney Plus or playing a new game on your PlayStation 5 and like people just click OK, just get out of the way, get out of the way. And that's all fine and dandy that, that Zoom have said here we've now separated. But I really don't expect it's done in a way that people know that they'll be storing, transmitting, reviewing, disclosing, preserving, blah, 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 wrapping their way through like everything. Then, so, um, yeah, so then, as I said, lo and behold, they clarified that customer content will not be used to train third party models without consent and make it clear that customers can consent to the use, of, use of their data. It's really all very confusing if you were to get sucked into that world. Uh, to me, Mike, it's a storm in, in, a, in a teacup. I think it's no big deal. Like if you use any electric device with the possible, I suppose, exception of your toaster, the internet is listening and watching and learning. It's judging you. And mark my words, in five years, Samsung are going to release an AI-powered refrigerator that will tell the team back in Samsung HQ uh, to release a, an AI-powered toaster so they can talk about you when you're not in the room. Did you see what that guy was wearing this morning at breakfast? But like, um, uh, like AI, it's moving in. It's all around us. And sure, Zoom's um, you know mega list of things they're going to do with your data was caught um it was picked up it was reported on in the media and while i say it's no big deal i i say it in full awareness that it's no big deal because everyone is probably doing it and i think it is a big deal but it's kind of it, it, they are just one brick on a wall of ai companies that are now have stuff on you they just so happen to go and tell you hey we're going to use this stuff for everything we can think of um so there you go big brother is watching we know it baby yeah, I think with something like Zoom, though, the fear is that because it's so much used for business communication and stuff, I imagine there's a mm -hmm. bunch of trade secrets and hush hush and conversations people would assume would be private. Like, I think if Facebook came out and said they're doing the same at WhatsApp right now, this would be a much bigger news story. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, so the. My presumption, which may be flawed or incorrect, is that live Zooms are live events that are not recorded. You have to opt in to record an event uh, or a broadcast, and that then, I presume, is deposited on their servers. I think an awful lot, I'd imagine 95% of Zooms are in the moment like a phone call, uh, not recorded. But that doesn't uh, lessen the point you made, Mike. There's no yeah. doubt. I mean, who in business hasn't had conf confidential conversations with colleagues or customers? Who hasn't? I mean, that's the nature of business. And for Zoom to now suddenly say, uh, that's ours, thanks very much. Uh, no, sorry, it's not. So, okay, uh, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change my mind. I think it is a big deal. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it's a big deal. I saw a number of people like on various forms of social media talking about the fact of, oh, you know, a lot of lawyers use Zoom as a way to communicate with um, their clients, you know, that effectively ruins like client privilege between a lawyer. Um, I know that some people like Zoom is sometimes used by medical pr uh, professionals in order to, you know, check in with the patient that effectively ruins uh, doctor patient confidentiality. Um, mm. I know that uh, something I saw with in the strike community of the WGA, they were like during 2020, we all got in the habit of planning whole television episodes and discussing them and working them out on Zoom. That continues to happen up until the strike. They basically were like, that's a huge breach of confidentiality. None of the studios are going to want, you know, their potential content ending up in some Zoom algorithm six months before an episode comes out. So, um, yeah, I think it could be it could damage their um business clientele significantly if they don't i don't know walk this back effectively and then talk about oh yeah no we encrypt your conversations we are we do not use your data blah 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 yeah i think zoom is having a bad week when it comes to reputational ja damage they mm. just announced that they're bringing all the employees back to the office as well which is that's wild doesn't now speak that the is last wild. Uh, zoom on. technology does it <laughs> Are you serious? That it really is kind of like um, I don't know, like Heinz saying, "Guess what? You're not allowed to use our ketchup anymore." Yeah. Ah, Zoom getting sick. Zoom getting sick of Zoom meetings is really. Ugh. Mm.
Yeah. Okay. On that note, we're going to finish up. Uh, but before we do, I just want to give a quick word from our friends and sponsors at Vodafone Business. Uh, I used to think of Vodafone Business as only a reliable provider of mobile and broadband needs, but they're really stepping up to help Irish businesses grow and flourish in an increasingly digital world. So they now offer a whole array of digital apps from productivity tools and security solutions to IT support and even website builders. More recently, Vodafone have launched their VHub digital advisory service. With its new service, Irish businesses of all sizes can get free one-to-one digital support and advice tailored to their business by simply booking a call with one of the VHub digital experts on the Vodafone business website. Search Vodafone VHub for more information. Okay, Em and Emery, thank you very much for joining me and thanks everyone for listening. That's it for today's show. If you have any questions you'd like to answer or elevator pitches you'd like to tackle, make sure to get in touch. You can find us on Twitter at MyWallStreetHQ. On TikTok at MyWallStreet, or simply just email us at pod at MyWallStreet.com. If you're enjoying the show, make sure to tell your friends about us. Don't forget to leave a review on whatever podcast platform you listen to us on. Thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.